Hello, and welcome to the third class in my course on integration theory. So, the key things we learned last class was that if we have an outer measure, u star, it gives rise to a sigma algebra, which we can call mu star. And uh, we learned that uh, there is something called the Lebesgue outer measure, and we proved that it is an outer measure. Those were the key things. Okay, so this means, well, what it, does it mean to be, well, what's the condition for being in here that's important to remember, and that is that mu star of A is equal to mu star A intersect B plus mu star of A intersect B C for all A. Now that was the same as B being in our sigma algebra, right? So it's a bit backwards. A is just a, a dummy set that you test on. This should hold for all sets A. Okay. So this. Uh, important to remember this identity. So if this is an outer measure, then it's going to give rise to a sigma algebra. And lambda star, and this is called the Lebesgue sigma algebra. I it's really annoying to wait for the blackboard to, to dry out. So I hope you can see this. So there's the Lebesgue sigma algebra. And then there is also the Borel sigma algebra. And these two, at this point in time, we have no idea um, what's the connection here. They could be the same, could be, well, we have no idea. So basically the main theory we want to establish today, maybe not all of it today, but anyway, just to set things, set the record straight, what's true and not here, um, is the following. So the smallest one here is the Borel sigma algebra. It's smaller than the Lebesgue sigma algebra and the two are not the same. This in turn is smaller than the power set of the real line, and these two are also not the same. Now, what here do we need to prove and what do we know? Well, actually we need to prove all of this, and we need to prove this, all of these are non-trivial statements, that this is a subset of that, that is trivial. Yeah, because all this is a collection of sets of R, so then it is in the power set. Okay, so let's start with oh. So the proposition now is just that the Borel sigma algebra is smaller than the Lebesgue sigma algebra. So in other words, if a set is Borel measurable, then it is Lebesgue measurable. Being Lebesgue measurable, this is just testing this identity on the any Borel set, we need to test this. With Lambda star instead of mu star, of course. Now, here's a problem that we don't, you know, this is what makes this difficult. You can't just take a set, in, a general set in a Borel sigma algebra and say, okay, this is my typical Borel set, because we have no idea how they look like. Yeah, because everything here is a bit non constructive. So, how do we deal with this fact that we're going to prove something? about an object that we don't know much about. This is, um, 
yeah, what makes this theory in the end beautiful that, that there are ways around that. So if I could just find the book, where the hell did I put it? God damn it. It was here just now. Oh, it's under the pizza. Okay. This is the book we use. Um, yeah, so you have to read the book. I can't tell you every possible um, proof in here or write up every theory that is of essence. So in chapter 1.1, there is a proposition 1.1.4, which gives different types of sets that generate the Borel sigma algebra. So the way we defined this guy was to say that, well, it's generated by all open sets. Okay, but open sets on the real line, at least, that's just unions of open intervals. So then we might as well just say, well, it's generated by the open intervals. But then the complement of that is the closed intervals. So then you can, it's not hard to see, then that's what this proof is about, that we might as well have taken the, the, the closed intervals, uh, sorry, closed sets and say, well, it's the smallest sigma algebra generated by those. So then you ask, okay, what's the simplest way? What's the smallest collection of sets that will give me my Borel sigma algebra? Uh, that are half axes. Yeah. So if you just consider the collection um, of sets of this form, so lemma B of R is generated by the collection of sets from minus infinity up to D, where you allow B to be a free endpoint. So all semi-axis. That is enough. If you do the smallest sigma algebra that contains this, you can easily prove then that well, then you're allowed to take complements of so the complement of one semi-axis and another, that's a semi-open interval. And then once you have those, you can... Um, Okay, let me write that. So you have um, a minus infinity of A from B, and then you say minus minus infinity of A. So if you're allowed, you know, the sigma algebra generated by these guys, you're allowed to take complement. Okay, so what is this? This is just the interval from A open to B closed. So now the smallest sigma algebra generated by these guys will contain such intervals. And then from there to say that they contain all open intervals. Is, this is just a small step. Okay, getting back now, how can we prove an um, inclusion like this? So I want to say that well, this is true for any Borel set. Well, here's where it gets very clever. Let's try something much simpler. Let's just try to say that it's true. Uh, this identity holds true for sets of this type. If we have that, then now I can say, oh, well, okay, then this is a sigma algebra that contains these guys. But this was supposed to be the smallest sigma algebra that contains those guys. Hence, this is bigger than or equal to this. Okay, so I don't write that proof down um, because I just said it. So, um, and now then testing that this condition, uh, uh, that this condition holds for these kind of sets, it, it is some work, but it's not very difficult. So, Okay, this starts out grandiose. I already made my first mistake. So anyways, let me go again. So what we want is to prove that the lambda star of A, where A is now any set, is bigger than or equal to lambda star of A intersects 
minus infinity to b plus lambda star of a intersect b of infinity. Yeah? Why only inequality here? We want equality. Well, because what I said last class, the obvious, uh, sorry, the, the reverse inequality is obvious. So we don't need to, I mean, it follows from the fact that lambda star is an outer measure. So this is the only difficult thing to show. Um, if we have this, then we establish that this set is measurable, means that this set is in this sigma algebra. That is a smaller sigma algebra which contains all these sets, so then this one has to be big. Fine. Can we paint this situation? Yes. So it looks a bit like this. Here's the real line. And then it's very hard to paint a set A, which is all over the place. So I just make some zoom. But it's a bit here all over the place, yeah? And then here is the point B. Now, to get to this number, we want to get close to this number. We want to work with something we understand, which means we have to cover this guy A with open intervals and use the definition of this as an infimum. So what we're going to do is the usual one. We take an epsilon. I'm not even going to write take epsilon arbitrary. So we do a covering of A with sets from AK to BK, and we do it in such a way that if we sum it all up, then thanks to adding a bit epsilon here, we, we, we can get below. So usually the inequality goes the other way. This is defined as the infimum of all such sums, but adding a bit of epsilon, we can flip the inequality around. So what are these AK, BKs? Well, it's just, here could be A1, B1, and then maybe over here is A2, B2, and here is then A3, B3, and so on. Maybe there's some overlap here, okay? Um, doesn't matter. Okay, and now we want to say that, well, we want to somehow relate this sum to this set and the other set. Now, if I give this the color green and this the color yellow, you see that, I mean, the green part is here and the yellow part is here. So it would be easy to just split this. If, if a set is on this side, I call it green. If a set is on the other side, I call it yellow. And then I just split them up in two. The only problem is this one that is kind of on both sides. Should it be green or should it be yellow? Well, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to, this is just a notation problem. So what we're going to do for sets like this, we're going to split them up in two pieces. A3 going a little bit beyond this point B. I'll do a zoom down here. So if this is A3, here's the point B, then I'm going to take a point here, D3, and then I'm going to take a point on the other side, C3, and then over here is D3, okay? That should have been a B. In such a way that this gap here is very small. So I'm going to make sure that the gap which is D3 minus C3. It's less than this guy, epsilon divided by two to the power of three. Or if this is four, then I just put the four there and so on. Okay, so how do we get, how do we deal with this if I have a set like this one? I'm, I'm just translating it up here. So I have, a2 over there and B2 over there. Well, then since this doesn't cut the point B here, I'm just going to let uh, this 
P equal to C2 equal to P2. Yeah, it's like if you slide this interval a bit more here, then these two points, P3 and C3, they kind of end up all at this side. Similarly here, let's just move this up so we can paint a bit. Now I'm going to have A1 here and then a sorry b1 equal to c1 equal to d1 over at that end point. The point is that with this type of definition, I now have that a intersect minus infinity to b is a subset of infinite union k goes from one to infinity of a k comma d k yeah open a intersect that should have been a b So A intersect minus infinity to, sorry, A intersect B up to infinity is a subset in a similar way of the interval from CK up to BK. And clearly, I have, well, either I have that, I mean, if we look at the length now of of uh, an interval like this plus an interval like this, I get dk minus ak plus bk minus ck. Well, either three of these numbers are the same. So in, in, in this case or in that case, this is just going to cancel out and become dk minus ak. Or we're in this situation that uh, there's an overlap, and then I get dk minus ak plus dk minus ck. But I've chosen them so that I'm respecting this inequality. So at the end of the day, I can conclude that this is always less than pk minus ak plus something small and that was the point okay so now with this i'm having that lambda star a intersect interval from minus infinity up to b plus lambda star a intersect b up to infinity is less than or equal to well the first one is less than sum from one to infinity a k up to d k, and the other one is less than infinity. Sorry, sum from infin sum from one to infinity c k uh, d k. And now again, this Riemann rearrangement type of results. It doesn't matter in which order I sum here, so I can fiddle around and do this as one sum over k. And then I use this inequality, so this is less than or equal to sum from 1 to infinity, dk minus ak plus epsilon divided by 2 to the power of k. And now you see where this is going. This is less than or equal to, this is how we chose them. So the infinite sum is less than or equal to this plus epsilon. And the infinite sum here over these guys is also less than epsilon. So, so this holds true for all epsilon, which means that we can throw away two epsilon in the end. And this sum is smaller than that, as was to be established. Um, I don't think this 
argument with the splitting like this. It's not how they do it in the book, and it's probably not the most elegant one, but I think it's the most visual one. I think the book has some like more clever thing. Okay. All right, so now the class gets really exciting. We've seen some difficult theorems and they were like elegant, beautiful, but now it gets exciting. We're gonna see some, some more poetry style kind of arguments. In showing that the Lebesgue sigma algebra is not equal to the power set of R. So this is a kind of different type of statement. I have to somehow extract a set, any set which is so complicated that it can't possibly be in here. How on earth would you go on about doing that? I encourage you to stop and just think about it before you keep watching the movie. One thing which I haven't said explicitly, but it's very easy to prove, is that uh, all of these guys are translation invariant. This means that if A is in the sigma algebra, it follows that A plus X is in the sigma algebra for all X. It's Right? Well, come to think of it, maybe it's not that obvious, but the Lebesgue measure, so intervals, you can move them without changing the size, right? Which means that if you translate a set A, the Lebesgue outer measure is not going to change. Now, if you start looking at things like a translation of a set A intersected with B, that's, um, if you translate that back, it's just, a intersected with a negative, like reverse direction translation of B. And you play around with these things and you see that um, if a set A is Lebesgue measurable, then also a translation would be Lebesgue measurable. The details are in the fairly short proposition 1.4.4. So I'm not going to bother you with that. Anyways, so for this beautiful argument, which this is not, this is just time consuming argument. We just, the only thing we know that we're going to use about Lebesgue sigma algebra is this fact that we can translate without leaving. And based on that solemnly, we're going to come up uh, uh, with a very difficult set so that it can't be Lebesgue measurable. Now, how on earth would you do that? Well, anytime, not anytime, many times you think, how on earth would I do that? You have to remember the axiom of choice. So, proof. We define an equivalence relation on R by saying X is equivalent with Y if and only if X minus y is a rational number. Now you need to know some set theory here. So anytime you have an equivalence relationship, it partitions the set into cosets, into sets that, so the set that contains all equivalent numbers will be one set. And then every such set is disjoint from another one. Okay, so this provides a partitioning of the real line into different equivalence sets. I wonder if it does that in the appendix or if it just assumes that you should know it. No, it just assumes that you should know it, but the axiom of choice is written here in A12, 13, and 14 a bit, or in 11 as well about what that means. So I'm not going through that. So, okay, we have an equivalence relation that gives rise, uh, that gives rise to equivalent sets. So now we have a collection of sets, the equivalent sets, and the axiom of choice 
tells us that I can pick exactly one member from every set. Okay, and it's no restriction to say that that member should be between zero and one because all these sets have members. All the equivalent sets have points between zero and one. So let E be a set of representatives of each equivalence class. And we also demand that E is a subset between zero and one. And now we let We let QK be an enumeration of the rational numbers in the interval between minus one to one. Where is this all leading me? Okay, then I'm gonna write it here. Okay, like that. The interval from zero to one is a subset of the infinite union of QK plus E, which is a subset of minus one to two. Why is this? Because, well, let's paint a, a picture here. So here is zero, here's one, here is two, and here is minus one. So this set E, is somehow all over inside this place between zero and one. There are a lot of them, right? Because each equivalence class contains countably many uh, numbers. The real line is uncountable, so E must also be uncountable. Now, if I take any number R, it's going to be in some equivalence class. So there's going to be some number E in this set E such as this minus this is a rational number. Meaning that this E plus this rational number, this rational number is gonna be less than one in modulus, so either between minus one and plus one. So it's gonna be a rational number in here. So there exists a QK such that E plus my QK gives me R, that is this inclusion here. So zero to one is a subset here. And then this inclusion is pretty obvious because the numbers in E are less than between zero and one and the numbers QK are between minus one and plus one. So that's just uh, obvious. Okay. Now here's the beauty. So if, E would be a member of the Lebesgue sigma algebra, then so are all the translations, right? So all of these translations of E are going to have the same measure. Now, Taking this inclusion here, we see that, well, the outer measure of zero to one, that's just one. Well, I heard some strange noises. It's actually getting kind of late. Probably alone in the building. Better get out of here. Uh, but first, I have to finish this proof. Okay, so QK plus E. Okay, so the infinite sum of these guys. 
Man, there are so many details here that you just take them for granted. And then after talking a while, let's see that, oh, I need to explain something more here. Okay, this is a subset of the infinite union here. So this inequality, that's always gonna be true because basically using the fact that lambda star is an outer measure. Now, what we're gonna do is now to say that we have this. So here is where we need the assumption that this set is in the Lebesgue sigma algebra, because then uh, this is the identity. In, if this is in the Lebesgue sigma algebra, then by the proof of the previous lecture, lambda star is a measure, it acts as a measure on the Lebesgue sigma algebra. So then I have identity here, given, of course, that these are disjoint, but that's um, easy to see. So if E plus Q1, intersect E plus Q2 uh, would have some number in it. Let's call that R. Then we get, we get that R is equal to some representative, let's call it E1 plus Q1. And that's also equal to E2 plus Q2. Of course, Q1 and Q1 is different, and these two are different. So this means that E1 minus E2 is in the rational numbers. And that's impossible because we chose e, e, each guy in set E is a representative of one, exactly one equivalence class, not two. So two different E's. If the difference is rational, then they are in the same equivalence class. So that can't happen. So, okay, all of these sets are disjoint. And then we can use this identity if the sets E are in here. But then this infinite union contains the set minus one up to two. So then we have, now I'm just using again, that lambda star is now the measure and that is three. Okay. And now by the translation invariance, each of these numbers here, they are not different, they are the same. So if this number is zero, this infinite sum is zero and we violate the left-hand side. I'm pretty sure this number is actually gonna be equal to one. But if it's equal to some smaller number, whatever small number there is, if you make an infinite sum over the same number, you get infinity, and then you violate the right-hand side. So it's not the correct conclusion to say that, oh, this number doesn't exist because the outer measure always assigns a number to any set. As I said, I think it is one, but this whole calculation is not true for any such number, meaning that the only assumption we did was this must be false. So we have constructed a set which cannot be in here. So um, such sets exist. Beautiful. Think that over and I'm actually tired and I'm afraid of the ghost down here in the basement. So I'm gonna go home and continue this some other day when my brain is back on track. Hi, so new day, same clothes. Uh, you know, if you wanna blend in as a mathematician, it's important to not change clothes unless it's really necessary. Um, where were we in the lecture? We had established that the Borel sigma algebra is smaller than or equal to 
Lebesgue sigma algebra, which was smaller than, but not equal to the power set of R. And actually now, if you just follow the book, it goes on talking about other things, but I wanna kind of finish this story and focus on the fact that we also do not have equality here. Which is another very fascinating argument. I think understanding, so, so this argument is based on something called Cantor functions and Cantor sets and understanding such sets uh, is, is, is important for this course. So I wouldn't say it's over course, but maybe if the very confused by the material and you want to get to something substantial, maybe you want to watch this uh, at some later point in time. So, so what I'm going to explain now is being explained in the book in 1.4.6 and onwards to 1.4.9. Okay, so what is a counter set? Counter sets and counter functions are very useful for constructing all sorts of counterintuitive or more advanced uh, set theoretic examples. So um, it's a subset of the, re of the integral from zero to one with a few peculiar properties. Most of all, it has the cardinality of the continuum, so R, meaning you can have a bijection between this set and the real numbers. Yet it has measure zero. So, so far, the only like fat set we know that has measure zero uh, is, uh, is uh, Q, the rational numbers, right? That was fascinating that it has measure zero given that it's dense, you know, it's all over the place. Now we're taking a set which is even more dense in the sense, is it, in the sense that it has the cardinality of the R and still measure zero. Uh, the construction is not that difficult actually. So, So here's the interval between zero and one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out the middle third. Meaning that what's left is gonna be my set K1. This is an inductive construction, so they will come except the K2 and so on. So let me then change color. Now I just repeat what I did on each of these two intervals. What this would point would be like one over nine, two over nine, and over here we have seven over nine and eight divided by nine. Okay, and what remains then is gonna be my K2. And in red, now you get the point, right? So here, I will remove this, I will remove this, I will remove that, and I will remove that. And what remains, not what I removed, is gonna be called K3. So that would be this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and that one combined will be K3. Okay. What is the measure of these sets? So we know now, I never proved that, but uh, it's, I told you to read it in the book. The length, the Lebesgue measure of an interval is the length of the interval as we want it to, right? So for K1, I removed one third, meaning what's left is two thirds. So the Lebesgue measure of K1 is equal to two thirds. And note now, we don't need to write the star because we know this is a closed set. Actually, that's important. When I remove, I remove the open interval. So what remains is always closed. Um, 
Okay, so we know that closed sets generate the Borel sigma algebra, which is a subset of the Lebesgue sigma algebra. So these are measurable, and therefore we don't need to put the star here because the outer measure lambda star restricted here is a measure, and then we just write lambda. Okay, in the second step, when I did the remove the green portion, I removed one third from here and I removed one third from here. So of the total set that remained, I removed a third. So what remains is again two thirds of what I had in the previous step. So lambda of k2 is going to be two thirds to the power of two, lambda of k3 is going to be two thirds to the power of three, and so on. So now I'm going to define the Cantor set A as the infinite intersection, K going from one to infinity of these sets KJ. So what can we say about this new set K? Well, all of these guys KJ are closed. And being closed is something which is uh, a property which survives taking infinite intersections. So uh, this set is still closed. It has no interior point. What means an interior point? Well, it's a point where you can put a small interval around it. Now, clearly, any point that remains on, let's say, step three of the construction here, if it's going to stick to the end, so it's, it's in all of these kj's, every time, so now it's in an interval here of length one divided by nine. But I'm going to chop that interval up. And every time it's still in the process, I'm going to chop whatever interval it's in, in the middle and remove a third. So there's no way I could get an, any open interval in the limit process when I take this, because the intervals are all the time getting chopped up in smaller and smaller pieces. So this is not going to have any interior point. Now, what is finally the measure of this set? Well, hey, so remember now proposition, I think it was one, two, four, or five. Here I have an intersection, infinite intersection of decreasing sets where the first set has a finite measure. Then I'm allowed to use this formula. And well, we clearly see here that you know kj is going to have this number, which is less than one to the power of j. So the limit there is only zero. And it has zero measure, then um, that can, it has zero measure. Then at least my intuition tells me that, well, this is a very small set. Completely being on the contrary to the idea that it has the cardinality of the continuum. So these two facts combined don't really add up in our heads. But it does have the cardinality of the continuum. And now we're going to see why. OK, I needed to think a little bit. So to prove now that k has the cardinality of the continuum, we go on as follows. So take a point, this guy. Take a point x somewhere here in this little remaining interval there. OK, so k as cardinality of the real numbers. This is what we're trying to establish now. And given x in k, I'm going to associate with that a sequence of zeros and ones in the following way. So the first time I split my interval from zero to one up in two pieces, I have a left piece and the right piece. Where is x? It's to the right. So I'm going to give it the number uh, 1. Next time I split it up, what happens then? So the green piece is taken out. 
And now x is to the left and not to the right, meaning I'm going to give it a zero. And we continue to this the third time. The interval where x is in is chopped off. Now I'm taking out the red piece, whereas x, well, it's again to the right. So I'm going to give it number one. And like this, you realize that any x can be associated with a unique binary sequence. A binary sequence is a series of zeros and ones. And it is well known, I'll indicate why in a second, the binary sequences are in, um, have the same cardinality as the real numbers. So this was for this particular point. So in general, I'm going to associate with x a sequence a1, a2, a3, dot, 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 which is a binary sequence. In fact, you can even formalize this and make it into a, a mapping, a bijection between the binary sequences. Let's call the set of binary sequences for BS. <laughs> um, so how do we produce a bijection between BS and X? Well, sorry, between BS and K. So let's define a function iota from K into BS in the following way. So we just, um, okay, so the first time we cut out this white guy, X is to the right. So I'm going to write x like this. Well, I get a1 times two thirds because a1 is one, right? So I end up here. The next time I want to move, so I'm chopping up this piece. So either x, if x is here, I have to move to this point, which would take, so the remaining interval has length a third. And I would go two thirds of that. But now I'm not moving because x is to the left of the green chunk. So, anyways, like this. Okay. For the third number, I'm getting, now I do want to move, I want to move to this point here where the red interval ends. So, how much am I to work with here? Well, the interval here is length one over nine. And I can then move two thirds of that. So you start to see a pattern here a3, one over three to the power of two, and then two thirds plus dot, dot, dot. Um, right. So if you think about this, clearly this process, if I keep adding like this, and I take a limit, I'm going to get my point X. So the map iota is going to go from BS into K by doing precisely this. So iota of the sequence AJ, J goes from 1 to infinity. It's going to be infinite sum j from 1 to infinity, and then a j 1 over 3 to the power of j minus 1 times 2 divided by 3. So, well, yeah, I could have written that a bit nicely, more nicely, but it uh, doesn't matter. So now this is a bijection. So for every x, it can be reached by this infinite sum. And correspondingly, uh, every sequence like this gives us exactly one x. If we change the sequence, we get another x. So that differentiates this mapping between from this one, gamma on binary sequences into the interval zero to one, given by gamma
Yeah, okay. So let me also. So this is the usual mapping you have between a decimal expansion of a number in the binary number system and the number itself. So to see the similarities, maybe I can write this a bit nicely. So it is infinite sum here, j goes from one to infinity, two a j divided by three to the power of j. So these two mappings behave quite differently because here I do get a bijection with my iota, but with my gamma, I do not get a bijection because of the same reason. If I do the sequence, um, one, 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 okay. Yeah, if, if I were to do that, this thing, if this infinite sum is equal to one, and in the binary number system, there's a different way of expressing one, namely by writing one dot zero, and then an infinite row of zeros. So in the same way, the number one half can, can be expressed either by the sequence zero, one, 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 or just one, and then zero, zero, zero. So this is not the bijection. But if we want to then paint the situation we have here, uh, unfortunately, I'm out of space. So, uh, so the situation looks like this. You have Vs. You have your Cantor set. You have Iota here being a bijection. And then you have here the interval 0 to 1. Gamma, and this is a surjection, meaning every sequence here is sent to, I mean, every number here is being mapped by some number here. So, in terms of cardinality, what does cardinality mean? Well, if you have a finite set, it's just that it's the same amount of points. For infinite sets, it's hard to say if they are equal size. So, the concept we have for equal size or same cardinality is just the existence of a bijection. So here we see that Vs and K, just by the existence of iota, they have the same cardinality. Now, from here to here, we can construct a surjection, meaning that we can cover all the points in here from some element here, but same point here can have many points here. Meaning that this set is somehow bigger than that set. So we get here that from this argument, we see that K, that's actually cardinality bigger than the interval from zero to one, but clearly K being a subset of the real number or K being a subset of zero to one, it has also smaller cardinality, right? Yeah, and zero to one is in bijection with the real line. That is also very, well, it's, it's a good exercise. You can work it out yourselves. So based on this, we figure out now that K and the real line have the same cardinality. Okay, so that was the Cantor set. Measure zero, cardinality of the continuum, no interior points, compact, very strange set. Now we're gonna construct a very strange function based on that, which was also interesting in its own right, and not only for the overall goal, which is constructing a counter example here. So now we're gonna, we're going to construct a function which is every, almost everywhere flat, continuous, and yet increasing. So I'm going to make this painting big. Okay, so again, the construction of the contour set started by taking out the middle term. And now I'm going to construct a function here on the complement of the contour set. which is just equal to one on top of this piece here, okay? Sorry, one half. Now in the second step of the Cantor set construction, I'm removing this guy and this guy. So then I'm gonna give my new function that I'm building the value a quarter here and and three quarters here. And I guess you're getting the point, right? So now we take out this piece, we give it one eight. And then here, 
we give it 3 8, 3 divided by 8 over here. We get uh, 5 divided by 8, and over here, uh, boom, 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 something like this, and so on. Okay, so like this, I'm building a function on the complement of the counter set, which takes values. So I'm going to call it f so on kc f takes all values in set s Okay, so the values it takes is going to be all, all rational numbers where the denominator is a power of two. So I'm going to, I just call that set S. Okay, it is non increasing. Sorry. This is something I have a problem with. You're not allowed to call this an increasing function in most English literature because it Exactly flat here, so then you should say non decreasing, it's not going down. I would like to just say increasing, but okay, that's what it is. So it is non decreasing. And now the question is uh, how do we extend it from a function? So, so far, it exists on the complement of the counter set, but it lacks the counter set, right? Although it has measure zero, it should have some values there as well. So, okay, so on K, we define F of X as the limit as y goes to x minus means from the left. And of course, we need to use points in the complement of k because that's the only place where f is defined before here. So basically what we're doing is we're kind of filling in here something like this, right? In fact, with this definition, of course, the number x over here gets a bigger number than over here, right? So this it is non decreasing. Well, that's true all over the place. Moreover, these numbers S, you know, all points with, uh, yeah, rational points where the divisor uh, denominator is, is a power of two, they are dense. So I can always, given any number here, C, I can always pick a, um, get arbitrarily close to it by points where this function has a plateau, meaning I can get to this number C by this limit. So it's easy to see thus that So f is actually surjective onto 0 0.1. So already here, this is surprising, right? Because note that if you take any point in Take any point in the complement of the counter set, that's an open set, so it has a small interval around it, and your function is always flat in that interval. So the derivative of the function exists at those points and is equal to zero there. The counter set having measure zero, we have now constructed a function that is continuous. It's very easy to see that it's continuous also because these gaps between the different levels, uh, I mean, that goes to zero. In the construction. So it is continuous, the derivative is zero, 
at almost every point, meaning that the points where this is not true has measure zero. And yet it manages to increase from zero to one. Yeah, so this is like a car that never moves, but still displaces itself <laughs> as time uh, goes. Very strange. Now, what can we do more with this funny function? Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to define a sort of inverse to this function, and that will explicitly produce a bijection between the interval zero to one and the Cantor set. So we don't actually, we didn't need that detour with the binary sequences, but it's of course, this is much more hard to visualize. Okay, so how do we find a sort of inverse? Well, this is clearly not invertible because it's flat um, all the time, but for every value here on this axis, there is at least, you know, since this is surjective, there is always some value that's going to take that value. So in that sense, we should be able to construct an inverse. It's just that if you take the number like one half, this problem is that there are many values here on this x-axis that gives you this number. And what we're going to do then is we're just going to always pick the left end point if there is a case of uh, doubt. All right, so we define, actually this will become what is called the right inverse. So um, define G of T equal to the infimum X such that of X is greater than or equal to t. Right. So if this is my point here t, then the set, the points f of x, sorry, then the points x, which gives this value or bigger, is going to be this whole interval and then everything beyond that, right? Because this function is increasing. If I take the infimum, I get the left end point here. And if I have a point t like this one, which is um, not on one of these flat plateaus, then I'm just taking the infimum of all the x's such that you know you're bigger than that, so you get uh, this value here. So for this point, you get this would be g of t1. If this is t1, if this is t2, here you would have the g of t2. Point is that for every t value, you get some value down here. And that value will always be in the counter set, right? Because if you're on one of these plateaus, you go to the end of it. And the plateaus are open set, so you go out of it, and then you are inside your counter set, which is closed. This guy, of course, is also in the counter set. So we get a sort of inverse here which is also an increasing function, sorry, non-decreasing function, but which only takes values in the counter set. So G becomes a non-decreasing bijection, and it is a right inverse in the sense that if I start here, I go to my value down here, and then I go back, then it's the same. So right inverse in the same sense that but not the other way around. If you flip these around, if I start here with an x, I go up here, you know, and then you do this function then. So actually, if you flip them around, you do g and then f, you would have a function that takes anything in the open interval and sends you down to the uh, left endpoint of that interval. Okay. So by what I just said, we have g of f of x is equal to x for all x in the Cantor set. So that's another way of seeing, or that's an explicit way of seeing that the image of G will 
be uh, the Cantor set. So G is surjective onto the Cantor set. Okay, and now we were what we were aiming for was to prove that the Borel sigma algebra and the Lebesgue sigma algebra are not the same. In fact, we can do that with this function G, but it requires a few more things we haven't established yet. So in the book, this comes in 2.10, actually, this construction and example that the Borel sigma algebra and the Lebesgue sigma algebra are not the same. But I find it um, just not right to not tell you that already. So what I will do now is I'll tell you how to use G to wrap up this bag with which sigma algebra belongs to which and so on. You know, we're going for this one. And then I'm gonna come back to this argument and finish it up properly once we have the necessary facts in place. So this will also serve as a, as a motivation for the more kind of technical things which are lined up in the next lecture uh, completeness, for example. Uh, it's one thing that maybe in the beginning you feel like, okay, now it's getting too detailed, but here you see uh, one application of why we need it. Okay, so to explain the idea here of how we produce a set which is not uh, in the Blurbeck sigma algebra, I have to paint the function g. Of course, this is an impossible task, but we remember that it sends the set 0 to 1 into a subset, uh, or it's surjective onto k. So here you have a very uh, small set of points in the sense that, well, it has measure 0. Now, you remember this E that was not measurable in this guy, yeah, that we constructed some time back, this lecture. So take that guy, this very ugly guy, okay? And then you send him through G into here. So then you have G of E becomes a subset on this axis, right? So you have G of E is a subset of K. So now we need two things, completeness. What does that mean? It means that any time a set has measure zero, it is measurable. This is true here, okay? So this set G of E will be some ugly thing, but it will have measure zero, so it will always be in here, okay? Okay, but then the set E itself, I get by sending it back through F, yeah? And both F and G, so, so so using this identity here, right? Okay, so we have this identity also by what I wrote up there. Now, both F and G are increasing functions. So, and the Borel sigma algebra has this nice property that anytime you have an increasing function and it sends, you send sets through that function, uh, it sends Borel measurable sets into new Borel measurable sets. So then, to Establish that is a simple fact, but we need then to study measurability of functions. So, but the idea here is that these are non decreasing. So, send moral sets into. Model sets. Okay, and then the punchline here is if m lambda star would be equal to the Borel sigma algebra, then 
By completeness, we have the G of E is in here, but then it is also Borel. But that means when I send it through F, I get another Borel set, but this is just E itself. So I've proved at the end of the day that E then must be Borel. Which is of course absurd because E wasn't even in this guy, which we have established is bigger than him. So this is a contradiction. The set which exists in the Lebesgue sigma algebra, but not in the Borel sigma algebra, is this guy. So this is a fairly explicit construction, at least more explicit than E. If you take E for granted, here's an explicit function that transforms E into a set which is Lebesgue measurable not uh, Borel measurable. So this you can read in 2.10 and 11, I think, in the book. This is the end, beautiful friend. This is the end, my